it's good to see each one of you here. <clears throat> some time ago, I was telling some folk that uh, I'd been invited to, invited to speak on this rally. And they said, uh, are you going to? And I said, what do you think? <laughs> I said, it's been 14 years since I spoke on an Al Iowa rally, and I'm getting homesick. So it's good to be here tonight. I feel very, very good about my subject this evening. I hope you will. <clears throat> God has provided a complete means of instruction for the Christian. We want to read 2 Timothy, the third chapter, the 16th and 17th verses. <clears throat> All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Does that sound like my subject is proved already? Well, we might as well sing the closing hymn then. <laughs> All right, uh, we have a few more things to say, however. In 2 Peter, the first chapter. 2 Peter 1, beginning with the second verse. <clears throat> Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Well, the topic that I have tonight has been proven again. God has given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. And that's about all we need. <clears throat> in other words, I mean, if you was put this title, in other words, I'm preaching tonight about the all-sufficiency of the scriptures. <clears throat> the early preachers of the Restoration Movement, and if you don't know what that is, <clears throat> back in the late 1700s and the early 1800s, there was a movement began in America of men who were members of different churches <clears throat> who said all we need is the Bible. And they followed this principle and this led them to lay aside their human creed books and their human church manuals and disciplines and so on and to <clears throat> follow nothing except the Bible and they laid down this principle, where the scriptures speak, we will speak, and where the scriptures are silent, we will be silent. And this led the Campbells to be immersed <clears throat> when they were just sprinkled people. This led them to reject infant baptism. This led them to have the Lord's Supper upon every first day of the week. <clears throat> and... Uh, uh, this will lead people today, if they will accept the all-sufficiency of the scriptures, this will lead them into a full life in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, who is it that doesn't accept the all-sufficiency of the scriptures? Well, the Roman Catholic Church would tell you. I mean, they won't make any bones about it. They would tell you that they don't accept the, the scriptures as sufficient, but rather that all of the dogmas of the popes and of the cardinals and so on, uh, they are as binding upon the church as is the scripture. <clears throat> the disciples of Christ do not accept the scriptures as all sufficient. The disciples of Christ, Christian church, in their restructure, <clears throat> one of their books, they say that Lockean empiricism and the rationalism of the Enlightenment and the biblical criticism 
has helped to shape and to form disciple theology. And they go on to say that the human experience of uh, experiencing the Lordship of Christ has <clears throat> provided them, that is the disciples, with a norm by which they can judge all things, including the scriptures, human experience of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And by this, they can judge everything now and even the scriptures. I wrote to several of those men and tried to get out of them what they were talking about when they said the experience of the Lordship of Christ. I said, what is it? Have you seen something? Have you heard something? And I never got a letter back from anybody or anyone that I talked to personally that could tell me anything, any kind of an experience that they'd had of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. You know, if you had an experience of the Lordship of Jesus Christ, you ought to be able to tell somebody what it is. Something about it, at least. <clears throat> but they say that this uh, uh, look, experience of the Lordship of Christ, or as it's called, in other words, the, the experience of the presence of Christ is a norm by which you can judge the Scriptures. But they've got the thing backwards. All of our experiences must be judged by the scriptures, are not the scriptures by our experience. <clears throat> well, there is not a denomination upon the face of the earth, of course, that actually really accepts the Bible as all sufficient, including the Bible Baptists. If they did, if they accepted the Bible as all sufficient, it would run them out of existence. It would make Christians only out of them and members of the Church of Christ only because that's all they were in the Bible and that's enough. That's all sufficient. And so there's not a one that <coughs> actually follows the, or accepts the all-sufficiency of the Scriptures. The Bible is all-sufficient to meet the needs of the human family. <clears throat> again and again, we need to emphasize the fact that the Bible is our only rule of faith and practice. It's all we need. It is all sufficient to thoroughly furnish a man unto every good work and to make a man even to the place, if he follows it all, that he will be perfect in Christ. <clears throat> First tonight, we will discuss this subject, <clears throat> that the Bible is the sufficient norm for our faith. Second, we will discuss that the Bible is the sufficient rule for our practice. <clears throat> First of all, the Bible is the sufficient rule, the sufficient norm for our faith. <clears throat> Someone says, so do you have articles of faith? Sure. <laughs> Here it is. That's our article of faith. <clears throat> in 2 Corinthians, the 5th chapter and the 7th verse, Paul says, we walk by faith and not by sight. A little short verse there. It's a good one. Now this walk by faith is, however, not a walk in darkness, but the walk of faith is in the glorious light of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I said something important there. I hope you got it. The walk of faith is not in darkness, but is in the glorious light of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. When we say that we walk by faith, it doesn't mean that we are just saying, well, I don't understand it, I don't see it, and uh, I'll just uh, take it anyway, and I'll just walk in it. And <clears throat> uh, we're walking in darkness when we do that, you see. But whenever we follow the scriptures, we're not walking in darkness, but we're walking in the glorious light of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews 12, 2 says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. <clears throat> Jesus Christ is the master teacher, and he is the prophet of the Christian and of the church. <clears throat> now, if you were to consider the uh, Seventh-day Advent church, the Mormon church, 
and so on. You'd find it in the some of the Adventist church. Their prophetess is Ellen G. White. If you were to go to the Mormon church, you'd find their prophet was um, uh, Joseph Smith, and so on. <clears throat> but in Christ's church, in the scriptures, which we say tonight is all sufficient, we find that it is the Christ. He is the master teacher. He is the prophet. As Jesus said to his disciples, he said, Call no man, Rabbi, for what is your master or your teacher? The Christ is the master. He is the teacher. He is the prophet. As um, Moses prophesied back in Deuteronomy 18, 15, when he said, God will raise up a prophet among you, my brother, like unto me. And him shall you hear in all things. And he that will not hear this prophet shall be cut off from among the people. And you find in Acts, the third chapter, and 22nd verse, that Peter applies this to Jesus Christ, that Christ is the prophet of the church. He is the teacher. We get all of our teaching from him, Christians do. And it's all sufficient for our faith in him. <clears throat> the New Testament is his word of faith. His word of faith. In 1 Timothy, the fourth chapter and the sixth verse, we read, if, you, if thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the doctrine of, in the words, in the words of faith. Nourished up in the words of faith and good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. Yes, Jesus Christ has given us the word of faith. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. You see, he begins our faith whenever we first come to understand the scriptural teaching concerning the Christ. We believe that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and he finishes our faith here upon the earth. <clears throat> there are two great questions that we, that we have in the scriptures, and that is, what think you of the Christ whose son is he? What say, or whom say ye that I am? And these two scriptures have the same answer, these two questions. Whom say ye that I am? Well, now these two questions are answered in the scriptures adequately, sufficiently for our faith in Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God. John says in John 20, 31, <clears throat> 30 and 31, <clears throat> many other things did Jesus do, and it says, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and in believing you might have life in his name. <clears throat> Now the scriptures, I say, are sufficient. They are adequate for our faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. John tells us of the pre-existence of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> that Jesus Christ <clears throat> was in the beginning with the Father. John, the first chapter, and the first through the third verses. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And the 14th verse says, And the Word was made flesh and dwell among us. Paul says in Philippians, the second chapter, beginning in the sixth verse, that though he was in the form of God, Jesus was in the form of God. He was in heaven with God. He was deity. And he was called the Word. He was with God, and he did not make himself of any reputation. But he took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And so Jesus Christ was in heaven with God, John says, and Paul affirms the same thing. And in John 17, 5, again, when Jesus was praying to the Father, he said, Father, glorify thou me with the glory which I had with thee. Before the world was. Jesus Christ was God. He was deity. He was in heaven with the Father. He looked down upon this earth. And had compassion upon sinful men. And he chose. To come to the earth. To give his life as a blood atonement. For the sins of the world. He chose to do this. While he was yet in heaven with the Father. First Timothy 1.15 says. It is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. Now it wasn't that he decided after his baptism that he would be the suffering servant of Isaiah 53 
And so he fit himself into that and got the Pharisees mad so they crucified him. So he'd be the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. No such thing. Paul says he came into the world for this purpose. To die for sinners. That he might save sinners. <clears throat> In 2 Corinthians 8 9, it says, though he was rich, why he enjoyed all the glories of heaven. He was in heaven with the Father where the streets are paved with gold. He was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, that we through his poverty might become rich. As the old beautiful song says, out of the ivory palaces into the world of woe. Only his great eternal love made my Savior go. <clears throat> Jesus was enjoying all the glories of heaven, but he left it all and was pressed into the form of a little babe and was begotten of the Holy Spirit and was born of the Virgin Mary. As Luke tells us in Luke, the first chapter, and the 30th verse, that the angel appeared unto Mary and said, Mary, hail Mary, you have found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And he went on to say, and thou shalt conceive and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great and so far. And Mary said, how can this be? Seeing that I know not a man or I have, I have not a husband. And the angel answered and said unto her, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. And that which shall be born to thee the holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. <clears throat> and so here we see <clears throat> Jesus Christ with having been with the Father coming into the world through a miraculous supernatural conception and birth beyond our comprehension but not beyond our faith. He led a perfect sinless life while he was here upon the earth. Though no other man ever so lived. The Son of God lived a perfect life. Though he was tipped in all points like as we are, yet he was, was without sin. We see him as he walked upon this earth that he showed God's power. That he was able <clears throat> out there on the sea when the disciples were scared to death. And that old ship was being tossed up and down, you know, in the waves. And they went to Jesus who was asleep. <laughs> He was sleeping through it all. He had peace, you see. Didn't bother him. But anyway, these disciples evidently uh, thinking that maybe the Lord would get up and help them bail the water out or something. Anyway, they said, Master, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And Jesus rose in the boat and said, Peace, be still. And those waves laid down like a lamb. And that wind back up the hillside, why he was calm, there was not a leaf moving. Those disciples stood there with their mouths open. And finally one of them said, What matter of man is this? That even the winds and the waves obey him. The Son of God. He came to Lazarus' tomb. And he groaned within himself. And he wept. And he prayed. It must have been that death was a hard one. Oh, but when he cried, Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus came out of that tomb alive. And Jesus said, turn him loose. Unbind him. <clears throat> yes, Jesus showed his power over nature, his power over death. Jesus showed us by his own resurrection, not only the power over death for himself, but also the power over death for us as on that third day he came out of the tomb alive as acts 1 3 says and he showed himself alive after many infallible proofs on the his disciples being seen of them 40 days <clears throat> and in first timothy 1 10 it says that life and immortality has been brought to light through the gospel jesus brought it to light through his resurrection and then we're told about this this great demonstration of power over death 
by his resurrection. We're told about this in the gospel of the resurrection. It has been revealed unto us. And uh, Paul could say in 1 Corinthians 15, 20, And now is Christ risen and become the first fruits of them that slept. Christ the first fruits, and then they are that are Christ that is coming. Because he lived after death, we also shall live after death. All that are in the grave will, will hear his voice and will come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of condemnation. <clears throat> the grave cannot hold him, and the grave will not be able to hold us who are his own. And because of, of this great a glory when we see the resurrected Christ in the gospel and we realize the power of the resurrected Christ, we can only fall at his feet with Thomas and cry, my Lord and my God. <clears throat> now, when our faith is rooted and grounded in Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God, then all of the rest of the things of Christianity fall in place in our faith. <clears throat> Even faith in God the Father. You know, <clears throat> we can see in nature God, the heavens declare his hand handiwork. We can see in man God, that here is a creature who's been wonderfully made, made in the image of Almighty God, who has a soul, who has the ability to plan and to carry out that plan and to speak an intelligent message. Man, with life, someone created him who had life, who was more powerful than man. But man cannot create anything like himself. Science can't even make an oak that'll grow. <clears throat> but somebody made man greater than man. I say we can see this in nature, but we see God the Father in the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> As uh, we read in John the 14th chapter when Jesus was telling the disciples that he was going to go away and prepare a place for them, come again and receive, the, receive them unto himself, that where he was they might be also. And uh, he said, whither I go, you know, and the way you know. And Thomas said, Lord, uh, we don't know where you're going, and how can we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father except by me. If you had known me, you should have known my Father also. <clears throat> and from henceforth, ye shall know him, or ye, ye know him, and have seen him. Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. And Jesus said, Have I been so long with you? And yet, hast thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Yes, Jesus Christ showed us the power of the Father. He showed us the love of the Father. <clears throat> and so on. He showed us the Father. And so one of the great evidences that God is, as the Hebrew, Hebrew writer says in Hebrews 11, 6, he that cometh unto God must believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder of those that, that diligently seek him. And whenever we look at Jesus Christ, we are convinced that God is. <clears throat> well, the rest of our faith. <clears throat> what are we to believe about the Holy Spirit? Well, ask the master teacher. And look in his word. And let it speak. As to who the baptism, to whom the baptism of the Holy Spirit was given, and what the Holy Spirit is to us, and what he does for us, and so on and so forth. What are we to believe about salvation, and redemption, and sanctification, and justification, and adoption? Well, ask the master teacher. It's all sufficient. His word. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. And his word is sufficient to tell us all about all these things. Now the disciples say, the disciples of Christ, the modern disciples say, that these words, salvation, redemption, sanctification, justification, <laughs> adoption, are all, they've all lost their meaning a long time ago. <clears throat> now uh, reconciliation is the big word, and that means that you get the whites and the blacks to quit fighting one another, you know. 
<clears throat> you get the whites to accept the blacks, the blacks accept the white, you've got reconciliation. And that's all there is to this thing, just about, you know. <clears throat> get rid of some of your prejudice, and that's salvation. <clears throat> well, these are good words, salvation, redemption, justification, and so on. They're good words, and uh, we, all, we only have to ask the master teacher and look to see what he has to say about it, and they're all explained fully to us. What are we to believe about the church? Well, again, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. He said, upon this rock, I will build my church. Peter, you'll have the keys to it, and so on. <clears throat> and so we just ask the master teacher, and we go to his word, and we find out what, to, what we are to uh, believe about the church, about its structure, that he is the head, he is the foundation, he is the all in all. We find out what we're to believe about the organization, the membership, the officers, and so on. And what is said there is all sufficient to furnish us unto all good works, all the good works of the church. <clears throat> the officers, the organization of the church in the New Testament is sufficient for the evangelization of the world today. It's all sufficient that we find in the New Testament. <clears throat> what are we to believe about its work, about its name, and so on and so forth? Well, we look to the, to the Word of God which is all sufficient. What are we to believe about eternity? <clears throat> Eternal life. Heaven. Well, it's revealed to us in the Word. What are we to believe about hell and eternal condemnation? <clears throat> well, we find our faith concerning these things in the Word of God. God has given a sufficient means for the complete instruction of the Christian <clears throat> it is all sufficient for our faith the second part it is all sufficient for our conduct now the first part that I preach hasn't been out of order maybe maybe you wonder what, where, where was he going well, right here <clears throat> this is a victory that overcomes the world even our faith and who is he that overcomes the world but he that believeth that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. So there we are. Our faith in Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God, is even basic for our conduct. <clears throat> the Bible is all sufficient for our practice. It is an all sufficient rule for our practice and our conduct, again, to our text. All scripture, given by inspiration of God, is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God might be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. The Bible is the rule book for the church. <clears throat> now, the church doesn't make its own rules. Uh, <clears throat> the church is not in the lawmaking business. Jesus made the laws. He is the head of the church. The church is to obey and to teach the rules that Christ has made and has revealed, Matthew 28. He said, go ye therefore and teach all nations, and baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. We don't want church rules. Why preach against those all of my life? Jesus condemned the Pharisees for such a thing, making rules. You've got to wash your hands before you eat and so forth, <clears throat> or you can't be one of us. <clears throat> And so uh, uh, we don't want church rules. <clears throat> well, I preached against the Methodist discipline and the church rules that are made therein all of my life. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> we don't want church rules. <clears throat> um, the non-musical folk have made church rules. One of the church rules is there can't be any instrument in, in the building. Another one is you have to come forward and you have to confess that the instrument is wrong or you can't be in our fellowship. Before we started the work in the city, I went to the non-musical preacher. Uh, he had told me, he said, it's, it's a shame that we're not united. Uh, I don't hold the music as a test of fellowship. And so I went down to see what the situation was. I said, uh, what about united? I said, I'd like to talk to you about it. Well, I guess it'd be all right. So we talked twice. Uh, first time, we just kind of felt one another out, you know, here and there and yonder. So the second time we got out of business, I said, um, on what grounds actually would you unite with us or we could unite with you? I said, now, concerning the music, first of all, uh, <clears throat> we're, we're not using the instrument. 
He's not you. But I said, uh, uh, <clears throat> you'll have to agree, however, that it's all right to invite in preachers that do use it to preach in a revival meeting. Now, you'll not make this an issue. We'll see about that before he comes. We just lay the instrument aside for you to be saved. Well, he kind of looked at the floor, and, and uh, I said, well, what about it? He said, uh, <clears throat> we, we can't do that. Well, I said, uh, what can you do? Well, he said, you and your folks would have to come over and confess that you've been wrong and use the instrument, and you can be a part of us. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> Church rules. Now it's time that we eat our own cooking and take our own medicine. I hear that some preachers and, and some folks in the church think that they have the right to make rules for themselves and for the rest of the congregation and that those rules are just as binding as if they were spelled out word for word in the Bible. <clears throat> are we the Church of Christ or the Catholic Church? <clears throat> No, we don't want church rules. But we want all of the Bible's rules. We want all of it. We want them all to be known. And we want them all to be loved. And we want them all to be obeyed by all of the church all of the time. <clears throat> they are all sufficient for the instruction of the Christian in his conduct. The psalmist back in Psalms 119 said... <clears throat> Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my pathway. In other words, it shows you where to walk and it shows you where not to walk. Just like you carry a ladder and you can see where to walk and where not to walk. You know, since uh, David wrote that, Christ has given us the light of the New Testament to where it is like a floodlight. David just had the, something kind of like a two-cell flashlight, you know, kind of hard to see a little bit. But we have the glorious light of a floodlight of Jesus' revelation shining upon our lives to show us the way and to show us where to stay out of that the devil won't get us. <clears throat> now God has given us commandments, God has given us examples, and God has given us Bible principles to guide us on the straight and narrow way. And by these three things, by commandments and examples and Bible principles, God has dealt surely with everything that is wrong. Everything that has ever been wrong, and everything that is wrong now, and everything that shall ever be wrong. And God has dealt with everything right, everything that was ever right, and everything that's right now, and everything that shall ever be right. Forbidding the wrong, and urging and commanding the right. By these three things. <clears throat> Well, 2 Timothy 3 cannot be true if that's not true. That uh, <clears throat> it is uh, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God might be perfect. Got to get out of wrong. It's going to be perfect. Got to get in right. It's going to be perfect. <clears throat> and so let's look at these three words for just a little bit. <clears throat> I'll be through whenever I'm through. Amen. If that's all right. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I get tired of hearing preachers preach sermonettes and, and uh, preach them three times so that they'll have a, an hour and a half sermon. <clears throat> when I get through, I'll quit. But I'm not through yet. <clears throat> uh, God has given us commandments. He's given us commandments concerning the use of the tongue. And I'm not going to get on another brother's sermon. <clears throat> Such things as <clears throat> lie not one to the other, but every man speak the truth of his neighbor. Swear not at all, and so on. God has given us commandments concerning growth in Christ. Add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. <clears throat> Why, these are things that every person, whether they are a Christian or not a Christian, would like to have. That's right. They're good, and everybody knows it. And we are told by commandment to add these things. We have commandments concerning the Holy Spirit. Grieve not the Spirit of God. <clears throat> Quench not the Spirit. Be not drunken with wine wherein is riot, but he says, be ye filled with the Holy Spirit. We have commandments concerning the church. <clears throat> Forsaking not this assembling of yourselves together as a matter of some is. We have commandments concerning prayer. Pray without ceasing. Continue in prayer. 
We have commandments <clears throat> concerning love. As Jesus said, a new commandment, give I unto you that you love one another as I have loved you. Hereby shall all men know that you are my disciples. And you know it's evident that all of the commandments of God are not being obeyed today. We have more to say about that later in another sermon, maybe. <clears throat> Again, John says concerning love, that this commandment we receive of him, that he that loveth God, love his brother also. For how can you, who have seen your brother, love not your brother whom you have seen, how can you love God whom you have not seen? Therefore, he that loveth God, I command to love his brother also. <clears throat> we have commandments, 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 on and on. Well, we have examples. We have examples concerning the Lord's Supper in Acts the second chapter and the 42nd verse. They continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in fellowship, in breaking of bread, and in prayer. In Acts the 20th chapter, the 7th verse, <clears throat> um, it says, And the disciples met together from the first day of the week, came together from the first day of the week to break bread. This is divine example of divinely inspired, divinely guided men of God to meet upon the first day of the week to break bread, which is the Lord's Supper. We have this example. Now there are those who every now and then you hear and say, well, uh, uh, I just don't see this, uh, uh, this uh, having the Lord's Supper every, every first day of the week. Um, <clears throat> I, I just don't see that. <clears throat> well, you know, we see it in divine example. We see it also, and I'll just show this in, it won't cost anymore. Uh, we also see it um, in <clears throat> need. 1 Corinthians 10, 16 says, the, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? And the bread which we break, is it not the communion of the bread of Christ, of the body of Christ? Now who is it that doesn't need that every first day of the week? I certainly do. And you know that's a strong argument for the practice. Need. <clears throat> but we have Bible example. We have Bible example concerning conversion, of course. Nine examples in the book of Acts. God tells us how to be saved. And then God demonstrates it by example through the book of Acts. Time and time and time and time again. We have examples of how baptism is performed. And they both went down into the water. And he baptized him. And they both came up out of the water. And that's the way baptism is. We're told how baptism is in direct words. Therefore, we're buried with him in baptism. And then we're showed how it's done. <clears throat> we have bad examples, too. As he says uh, concerning love, not as Cain, who slew his brother because his brother's works were righteous and his were evil. Be not like him, he says, 1 Corinthians 10, talking about the children of Israel when they were, were in the wilderness. And he said, these things are written for our example or in sample. <clears throat> that, uh, he says, that you uh, lust not as they lusted. And 23,000 fell in one day as the whole nation fell into fornication, adultery. And God slew 23,000 of them in one day. Bad example, he said, don't follow that. Don't tempt God as they tempted God, and so on and so forth. And so we have bad example as well as good example. <clears throat> we have an example of false teachers, as the Apostle Paul wrote to Titus <clears throat> concerning some, rather to uh, Timothy concerning some. In uh, Timothy, the second, second Timothy, second chapter, 17th verse, And their word eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenius and Philetus, who concerning the truth have heard, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrown the faith of some. And so here, we have a bad example of bad teachers <clears throat> and the evil uh, teachers of false doctrine. And uh, Paul says, I have delivered them unto the devil in another place concerning the same kind of a thing. <clears throat> we have example, the example of Jesus Christ in 1 John, the second chapter, in the sixth verse. And we read this concerning what John has to say. <clears throat> he says, He that, that saith he abideth in him ought himself also to walk even as he walked, as Jesus walked. Again in 1 John 3, the uh, third verse, And every man that hath this hope 
That is the hope of seeing Jesus and being like him. He purified himself even as he is pure. Another example. Purify himself as Jesus is pure. And that's real purity, you know. <clears throat> and again, in 1 Peter, the second chapter, and, excuse me, the 21st verse, he says, For even hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered, <clears throat> leaving us an example, that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. And when he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself unto him that judges righteously. <clears throat> and so we have all kinds of examples in the Bible. God showing us the truth. God completely instructing us, instructing us completely <clears throat> for our Christian conduct in the scriptures. Well, we have Bible principles in the scriptures. <clears throat> What's a Bible principle, preacher? Well, a Bible principle is a Bible statement that includes a class of things in which all or maybe none of them are mentioned by name. Now, you have a commandment that's mentioned directly there by name. But in a Bible principle, it includes a class of things that are not mentioned by name. Ephesians 5, 29, for instance. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. We have nothing mentioned there. <clears throat> Bad words, evil words, filthy words, filthy jokes, <clears throat> any kind of ungodly speech is forbidden. No corrupt communication out of your mouth. That's a Bible principle that includes a class of things. <clears throat> well, we have Bible principles, and uh, I don't want to get on somebody else's material, so I'll uh, cut it down to where I uh, don't think I will. <clears throat> Galatians, the fifth chapter, in the 19th verse, we have the works of the flesh here mentioned. <clears throat> and uh, it's uh, the 20th verse, uh, the 19th verse is where it begins. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, and I'm not going to read them all, the adultery, fornication, uh, envy, murder, drunkenness, and reveling. The principle there, and such like, things like these things. I tell you, he says, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. <clears throat> and so here we have a Bible principle. We have a Bible principle concerning fellowship in Ephesians 5, 11. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them, speak out against them. This is a Bible principle concerning any of the works of darkness that the devil would see fit <clears throat> to bring into existence, whether they be in existence now or whether they come into existence a hundred years in the future. This Bible principle still applies to anything that is a work of darkness. And we're to have no fellowship with it. <clears throat> Again, in 2 Corinthians 6, chapter, he says, Be not unequal yoked together with unbelievers, for what communion hath Christ with the devil and so on. Come ye out from among them and be a separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean, and I will receive you. Here is a Bible principle <clears throat> that uh, deals with a class of things. 1 John 2, 15 and 16. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. The lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, they're not of the Father, he says, but are of the world. <clears throat> and the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. And so here we have a, a Bible principle concerning our not even loving the things that have to do with the lust of the flesh and those things that tempt us through the lust of the eyes and those things that uh, have to do with the pride, the vanity of life. <clears throat> we are not to love these things. Whosoever is a friend of the world, James 4, 4, is an enemy of God. Abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. All kinds of Bible principles that have to do with worldliness in the life of the Christian. We have Bible principles <clears throat> that have to do with the use of the name of Jesus. Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have Bible principles that deal with false teaching. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul said, Galatians 1, 8 and 9, if we 
Though we are an angel from heaven preaching yet the gospel unto you, than that which we have preached unto you, let him be anathema. And I say unto you again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be anathema. Now, he didn't mention any doctrine there, any false doctrine. Any doctrine that is not according to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> we have uh, uh, Bible, Bible principles that deal with that which is excellent. Philippians, the first chapter, and the eighth and ninth verses. <clears throat> this is a good one. He says, um, <clears throat> This I pray, that your love, I'm reading the ninth verse of Philippians 1, may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment that you may approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense until the day of Christ, that you may approve the things that are excellent. Well, you know there are things that are good, and then there are other things that are excellent. And you know we can just uh, we can just give ourselves get our bu ourselves all busy about things that are good, and forget those things that are excellent. <clears throat> For instance, a, a church might have a ball team, and uh, if they could hold their tempers in the ball game, and if they could still do the work of, of the church, uh, and not to not neglect that, uh, I don't know that there's a sin in it. I mean, there's nothing wrong actually with playing ball. We've played it all of our lives. But there are excellent things, such as the getting together of a team to do things in the church. And if these things conflict in any way, God says that we are to choose the excellent things. <clears throat> well, we have the Bible principles concerning the use of our liberty. Why, in Christ we have great liberty. You know, we're not to uh, always take advantage of our liberty. <clears throat> As the Apostle Paul said, concerning a matter that he said that it didn't make any difference whether you ate or whether you didn't. That was meat that was offered to idols. They had this problem in that day. <clears throat> we don't have it, but we have others that follow the same principle. And he said, if he meat has been offered to idols, that is, would cause my brother to stumble. He said, I'll eat no more meat as long as I live. He had the liberty, but not when it caused his brother to stumble. It is good, he said, not to eat meat, nor to drink wine, nor to do anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is made weak, or is offended. Romans 14, 21. <clears throat> so our conduct, as far as our liberty concerned, <clears throat> is um, limited by Bible principle for the good of our brother. <clears throat> we have Bible principle concerning the use of our body. Romans, the 12th chapter, the first verse says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, to the mercy of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. <clears throat> on and on and on we could go. Now, these are a few Bible principles that we find in the Scriptures, a few commandments, a few of the examples. <clears throat> they thoroughly furnish us unto every good work. And uh, <clears throat> they are... God's complete instructions for the Christian. Now, what should we do with these Bible principles? Let me say just a few more things about them. What should we do with these Bible principles? Should we throw them out? Now, you've noticed when I've read these Bible principles and quoted them that uh, they didn't mention uh, all the time anything by name. Now, there are those folk <clears throat> who say that because they are not mentioned by name, that therefore they're only matters of opinion. <clears throat> we um, used to live out in Indiana, and we went up to Michigan City, Indiana. We heard about a congregation up there that uh, had just been organized, and we'd heard that it was uh, a little better than the average, and they were really trying to do things right. So we went up there to talk with uh, anybody we could find. So we ran on to one of the elders. And uh, we went to his house and sat down and talked a little bit, and he said, uh, who are you fellas? And we told him, and he said, uh, uh, how do you differ with us? Well, I said, uh, and I started right out with it. I said, one of the things is we differ on Bible principles. He said, what do you mean? I said, just this. <clears throat> that the Bible says that our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, which is given us of God. Therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are his. I said, therefore, we do not use tobacco nor drugs. And therefore, I said, we teach against it also from that scripture principle. And he said, well, uh, 
To me, that's just a matter of opinion. Well, uh, we were sitting there talking a little longer, and he said, oh, you know, something happened in the church here the other day, though. He said, I didn't like. And I said, oh, what was that? And he said, well, our young married people in Sunday school class, uh, they went down and had a party at the tavern. Well, he said, they, they, they didn't go in to drink. He said, they didn't go into the tavern, actually. He said, you went in the same door, but you went that way into a banquet room, and you went that way into the tavern. And he said, I, I just think that was terror. That was wrong. I said, oh, I said, how come? What he said, it just didn't look good. Well, I said, now, uh, <clears throat> you really think it's wrong? Oh, yeah. Well, I said, um, now, where in the Bible does it say thou shalt not have the Sunday school party in the tavern? Well, uh, I'm just dashing out a little more rope for him. He's going to hang himself a little bit. <laughs> and uh, uh, he said, uh, well, uh, I guess it doesn't say that in the Bible. But I said, you still think it's wrong? Yes, I think, I think it's wrong. He said, you know what you're doing? I said, you're using Bible principles. First Thessalonians 5.22. Avoid the very appearance of evil. Use it and didn't know it. <laughs> and uh, they use it whenever it is to their advantage. They're like to. <clears throat> but they will call you a Pharisee. They will call you a legalist. If you insist on trying to apply these principles. Which are as much as the word of God as any other word in the Bible. But they will call you a legalist. They'll call you a, 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 a Pharisee if, if you do this. I got some literature the other day, a sample, and <clears throat> uh, standing above his company. And uh, uh, in there they had the Pharisee of legalism. And they had on one of the pages <clears throat> in there, they had legalism now. And there they had, uh, thou shalt not uh, use tobacco. Uh, you shall go to church. And no, I, I'm sorry, you shall attend all the services, that's what I said. And uh, they had done some more things there of legalism today. Now, if I hadn't thought I was wasting my time, I'd like to have written to the fellow and said, now, uh, uh, let's put a few more in there, if you think this is legalism. How would this be? Uh, there's nothing wrong with um, LSD. I mean, uh, thou shalt not use LSD. That, that's legalism, is it? What about Peter's command, uh, repent and be about time? Is this, is this legalism? You know, the word legalism simply means, according to Webster, <clears throat> strict conformity to law. <clears throat> now, I, I realize this, that there are some legalists, like the Pharisees, who went through the form, and that's all they had. They were legalists. I mean, they were strict on going through the forms. But that did not mean that the forms were wrong but rather because their hearts were not in it. <clears throat> and so I can see that it's possible to be a legalist without having the spirit of Christ, and without having the love of Christ, and without doing things out of the heart of love. But also, <clears throat> we must be strict in conforming to the word of God. That's what God says. He says in 1 John, the second chapter, the third verse, Hereby do we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. And hereby, he said, we know that, <clears throat> uh, hereby do we know that we, it, oh, let me get started again. <laughs> if we say that we know him and keep not his commandments, he said, uh, we are a liar and the truth is not in him. He that saith, I know him and keep it not his commandments, is a liar and the truth is not in him. Okay. <clears throat> and so uh, what are we to do with these Bible principles? Why, we are to accept them. God has said something here. In the Bible principle, God has said something. And we must find out what it is that God has said and apply it, like it, and apply it to our lives. <clears throat> we shall, by God's commandments, by God's examples, by God's Bible principles, what God has said in his book, <clears throat> we shall by them live a full life in Jesus Christ if we follow them. If we reject them, we are rejecting God and God's word. They are an all-sufficient rule for our lives. 
<clears throat> let us be faithful and follow them and in following them john says in first john 2 29 if you know that he is righteous talking about jesus christ if the, if you know that he is righteous you know that everyone that continueth to do righteousness is begotten of him <clears throat> we're going to sing our closing song <clears throat> God has given us complete instruction. He's given us complete instruction for our faith. And he's given us complete instruction for our conduct in the Christian life. <clears throat> Did you pick out a hymn, brother? 438. 438. <clears throat> Singing together. Tonight, you'll give yourself to Jesus Christ. And as this old song says... Have thine own way, Lord. If that's what you can say in your heart, will you come as we stand and sing together? for your attention tonight um, <clears throat> I realized that this subject that I was on is a big subject and I'd like to preach a lot more things on it but they just I knew that it was keeping you too long uh, you come back in the morning and uh, <clears throat> uh, every service you can I know you have a, a lot to get into here before uh, I finish the thing Sunday night <clears throat> so there's a lot of good there you'll be here brother Ellis <clears throat>